So thanks everybody for attending our webinar today. Uh, today's webinar is part of a series of weekly webinars that 360 Energy is presenting to keep uh, corporate leaders objectively informed of the many changes, um, including risks and opportunity occurring in the energy industry. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'm going to ask David Arkell, our president and CEO, just to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Julie, and welcome to all webinar participants. Our focus at 360 Energy is energy excellence slash carbon solutions. While each can be managed separately, we believe they are tightly aligned because 80% of carbon emissions come from energy consumption. The link between carbon emissions and climate change is driving companies to revisit their sustainability plans. Important financial stakeholders like investors, banks, insurance companies are demanding that sustainability plans address climate-related risks. While it's not new, it's clear that a focus on carbon reduction with a goal of zero emission is at the forefront of plans now for companies, especially with increasing taxes and environmental need to act now. At 360 Energy, we help our customers to leverage their work in energy management to bridge the management best practices for zero emission and achieve carbon reductions. In Canada, I'm so proud of the leadership that we are seeing from some of the largest companies to take up this challenge and implement actions now to address climate change. Today, we're really fortunate to have John to provide an overview of the first sustainability-linked loan in Canadian history that helped Maple Leaf Foods be the best uh, be the first major food company globally to become carbon neutral. I'll now pass this over to Julie to formally introduce John to provide, and also provide the housekeeping items for the webinar. Oh, thanks, Steve. Um, just a little bit about our presenter, John, today. Uh, John Uren is the head of sustainable finance um, products and strategy at the Bank of Montreal. Uh, he leads product development and strategic initiatives across the enterprise uh, including raising capital and providing sustainable financial opportunities to clients. Uh, John's also a member of the CSA's group transition, CSA Group's Transition Sustainable Finance Technical Committee. Um, so just before we get started, and we're very excited, and thank you, John, for being here today. Um, just before we do get started, uh, just a reminder for people that have attended our webinar before and also just for any newcomers, uh, we do keep people muted while the presentation is going on just to reduce any background noise. Um, that being said, we definitely do encourage people to ask questions. There's a questions function in the, uh, the toggle panel for the webinar. Please do feel free to use that and uh, as questions come up, um, that's uh, I'll, I'll be able to introduce or uh, interrupt John, sorry, and uh, just uh, see if we can get some uh, answers for you. Um, so yes, again, please do uh, feel free to ask questions in the question function, and uh, I'll be happy to bring those up. So without any further ado, I will let uh, John get started. So again, thanks so much for joining us today, John. Oh, thank you, Julie and uh, David and Don as well from 360 Energy. Thank you for having me today. Just before I start, um, Julie, can you just confirm that everyone can see my screen, can see the slides I'll walk through today? Uh, I definitely can. Um, I can hear you well and see you. So thanks. <laughs> Perfect. I'm, uh, I'm apologies to everyone for being a few minutes late. I'm having, I had a few technical difficulties entirely on my end. So uh, thank you to 360 team for being patient and for everyone joining us here today. Um, so as Julie mentioned, I'm John Uran, I'm head of products and strategy on the sustainable finance team at BMO. And just a little bit of background about our team, maybe before I dive into sustainability link loans. Um, so in June of last year, our president and CEO, Daryl White, made a commitment for BMO to mobilize 400 billion towards sustainable finance by 2025. So a significant commitment and, and very large in the Canadian uh, landscape. And the way we're looking at it is, of course, it's not 400 billion in bank balance sheet money, but perhaps even more importantly, it's, it's really working with companies that are pursuing sustainable objectives, creating client investments that are aligned with uh, sustainable outcomes, and even setting up an impact investing fund where we've seeded it with $250 million. And the purpose of the fund is to invest in early clean and, and social tech companies that are really solving the problems of tomorrow. So 
we do have that fund set up uh, now and we're excited that we've made our first investment very recently. But what I wanted to talk to you today about and, and really a major portion of our $400 billion commitment is allocating capital or getting capital to companies that are pursuing sustainable outcomes. And this sustainability link loan is one example of that. You know, it's also sort of underwriting sustainable debt issuances. So we recently participated in an $8 billion World Bank sustainable development bond issuance in April. Uh, we were lead underwriter on that, uh, on that particular bond offering. So that's an example of how we're getting capital to companies uh, or in that case, a development bank as it's pursuing a sustainable outcome. Similarly, we do extensive lending to uh, renewable energy companies and other green borrowers. But for today's purposes, the sustainability link loan uh, we did with Maple Leaf Foods, and, and I will dive into it a little bit later in this presentation, but we did it in December uh, with them, and it was a $2 billion facility, the first of its kind in Canada. And we were really excited to be the lead sustainability structuring agent on the transaction and to really work closely with the borrower I think what we're most excited about was uh, the opportunity to work with future borrowers. Before I get to the Maple Leaf uh, Foods deal in any, more, um, in any more depth, let me just touch on what sustainability linked loans are, the way to appropriately structure one, and how we think it can be really meaningful uh, in the Canadian and North American marketplace. So on slide two uh, on my screen, you'll, you'll now see an overview of sustainability link loans. And, and what this slide is meant to do is really just convey, all right, what is the product? So the product is essentially a credit facility that incentivizes the borrower's achievement of certain predetermined sustainability performance objectives. Just for background, sustainability link loans were first, first came into, um, into light in 2017 in Europe. Uh, there were a handful of sustainability link loans structured in Europe three years ago, and then made its way into the US marketplace in 2018, and then of course into Canada in, in December of 2019. But really what it is, is it's, it's set up like an existing or you know a normal, otherwise normal revolving credit facility or term loan, with the difference being that the interest rate margin payable by the borrower can actually change depending on how they perform against those, those sustainability targets. So, if a company, if a borrower exceeds the sustainability target that you have structured and set with them, then they actually may pay lower interest rate margin. And similarly, if they don't hit that target or miss it uh, markedly, and the, some of the some of the um, magic goes into the structuring itself, then they may actually pay an additional uh, amount on the interest rate margin or a premium. There's a couple of different ways to create the sustainability targets, uh, and in all cases, you're sitting down with the borrower and and negotiating those targets, but they can they can be done either internally. So, you know, what is a key sustainability issue that that company faces or that's key in that particular sector or industry? For instance, greenhouse gas emissions are you know very relevant to a number of the borrowers that we're speaking to. So, in many cases, that's a very good target or um, or KPI that you would set. And so, for instance, if a borrower could reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, either absolute or intensity you know, over a period of a few years through the term of the facility, then they could stand to, to pay a lower interest rate. The other way you can define a sustainability target is externally. And when we say externally, what I'm referring to is there are third party uh, service providers like Sustainalytics or MSCI and others that provide a third party ESG risk rating of virtually, you know, most public companies uh, and some private companies as well. So the ESG risk rating, and, and apologies if you're all very familiar, but essentially what a company like Sustainalytics or MSCI is doing is looking at the unmanaged ESG risk of a company and assigning it a uh, quantitative, an actual value to say, based on the unmanaged risk, you're a, you know, a low risk of being affected by ESG and, and unmanaged ESG risks, perhaps you're medium, perhaps you're high. And then they divide you uh, and they rank you by subsector or the industry in which you operate as well. So for purposes of an SLL, sustainability link loan, the way that would work is, you know, the KPI or the sustainability target could actually be that ESG risk rating itself to say, okay, if it's a five-year term of a loan, if you can reduce or lower your ESG risk rating in that time, lower being good, meaning you have less unmanaged ESG risk, then you could stand to, to pay less interest on the facility and, and vice versa, of course. So 
those are sort of the two ways internally and externally that you would structure a sustainability target or KPI. Now, what makes this an interesting product and really accessible for borrowers like Maple Leaf Foods and certainly other borrowers we're having conversations with is that the proceeds of the loan or the revolver itself, they don't have to be allocated to predetermined green or social targets. So you're probably familiar, but a, a labeled green bond, for instance, a labeled green bond in order to be labeled has to be, uh, the framework has to be issued in alignment with the green bond principles. And, and principle one of the green bond principles is that the use of proceeds must fall under certain categories that have been established under the green bond principles. So renewable energy categories, water and waste management category, um, pollution prevention category. And in order to, to issue a labeled green bond and have it accepted by market and, and get that critical second party opinion from a Sustainalytics or MSCI, you need to actually show that you're going to use the bond proceeds on a green bond towards those projects. And then annually you need to do an impact report demonstrating what the greenhouse gas emission reduction, for instance, was if, if that's where you're using the bond proceeds for, or you know, from a pollution prevention, how much pollution was actually prevented based on using the bond proceeds towards that, those particular projects that fall in that category. With an SLL, you still need to report, and I'll get to that in a later slide. There's no question you wanna be reporting on how you have uh, performed against the predetermined uh, metrics. But at the outset, the capital doesn't have to be allocated to those particular projects. It would make sense for a borrower to do so given that they could stand to pay less interest on a loan facility if they indeed make you know, gains in, against their sustainability target, it would make sense to then use the proceeds towards achieving that particular sustainability goal, but it's not required. And you don't require a framework in the same way that you do with a green social or sustainability bond in order, again, to get that second party opinion and to have it be labeled as a, a certified bond. Um, the pricing incentive is entirely on an SLL based on whether or not you hit that target. Again, you can use the proceeds however you wish as a borrower. And at the bottom of this slide too, you'll see there's been significant growth in the SLL market over the past two years. And in fact, in 2019 alone, I believe there's 120 billion in sustainability link, link loans issued around the world. Of course, just the one in Canada, the Maple Leaf Foods $2 billion deal, but 120 across the globe. And um, I believe that was 160% increase year over year from 2018 uh, in SLL specifically. So the chart at the bottom you're seeing uh, is really just showing that exponential growth is the yellow section is the sustainability link loan. And you can see it growing, uh, especially since they were first introduced in 2017. So moving on to slide three, the way you structure a sustain, uh, sustainability link loan or an SLL is in alignment with the SLL principles. So the Loan Markets Association put out in 2019 these, these SLL principles and you're seeing them in the four gray boxes on slide three. So first of all, when you're setting sustainability targets, they have to be related to the borrower's overall sustainability or corporate responsibility, responsibility strategy. The example I like to give here is, you know, if you're working with an oil and gas client and the oil and gas client says, yeah, we acknowledge we have, you know, some you know, issues with absolute emissions of greenhouse gases, However, we want to issue a sustainability link loan with the target link to, you know, putting a recycling program in, in our kitchenette. It's a silly example, but the point being that, yes, that's great. A recycling program is great. However, it probably doesn't relate to your overall strategy, or at the very least, it's not one of the top 10 most important uh, CSR or sustainability strategies that you should have as a borrower in the oil and gas tank. Uh, oil and gas industry. And so, you know, the point number one when you're sitting down at the board to structure an SLL is it has to align with their existing social responsibility, but it also has to be relevant to the borrower or to the particular industry or sector in which they operate. Um, so that's a critical, critical piece. And, and so is number two in terms of target setting. You know, I, it, it, in the principles, it says measuring the, the sustainability of the borrower. This is more of an art than a science, but what I would say is that the targets that you select with the borrower, they have to be ambitious. They have to be meaningful. They can't simply be business as usual. So for example, if that same oil and, uh, that same oil and gas um, industry borrower has a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 
5% over five years, you know, 1% threshold each year may not cut it in terms of working backwards on the actual sustainability target on a year over year basis. The purpose of this product is to push a borrower a little further than business as usual to try and incent them either to make the necessary investment upfront so that they either you know, overachieve on whatever their long-term goal is or achieve it sooner than they would have expected. So in that case, maybe they have 5% reductions in three years versus five years because they're starting today. Um, but the point is it can't just be business as usual. It has to be ambitious and meaningful. When I say it's an art versus a science, what that requires for the structuring agent, in our case, BMO with Maple Leaf Foods, for instance, is to really sit down and understand the borrower's sustainability strategy, understand the goals that they've set, and then devise and figure out a way to really ensure that they're incentivized to make the progress that they need today so that they'll either reach or exceed their goals, uh, either you know full term, five years, or sooner uh, in the case of reaching the goal. So it is, uh, that, that is where a lot of the magic, I would say, comes in with SLLs, but it's a really important part of, uh, of structuring one. The last two principles, oh. Around oh, sorry, and... John. <laughs> so, sorry, I thought it might be a good time to jump in with a question if uh, if that uh, is okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, perfect. So I have a question now. What size of loan would BMO consider for sustainability linked loans? That's a great question. So we are uh, agnostic when it comes to the size of the loan. We are talking to borrowers from anything from a, a medium sized business that uh, you know, would be looking at very little from a, a loan or facility perspective, all the way up to the two billion that we did with Maple Leaf, Maple Leaf Foods. And so, I guess the way I would answer that is, there's no minimum. Um, where this, where the requirements come in, and where it makes it a little more meaningful of conversation, is around whether the borrower is already tracking and ideally reporting on where their sustainability is for target setting purposes. And so, when I say that, what I mean is. If we're going to benchmark where you are today and then where you want to get to over five years, we need to know that first point, which is where you are today. So the borrower needs to be sophisticated enough that they are tracking against, and it doesn't have to be greenhouse gas emissions, and that one, especially with scope one, two, and three, can be really complicated. But whatever environmental target they're setting, and again, that's relevant to them and the industry in which they operate, they need to be tracking it today. And once we have that, we can then structure a loan around that because we have the, the baseline or the benchmark uh, amount from a reporting perspective. The facility size doesn't matter at that point. We can, we can do it for any size, and, and we are talking to clients across the spectrum from a, from a facility size. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Okay. Uh, not at this point. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks for the questions. Please do jump in. I do want this to be uh, some back and forth. So, um, just picking back up on the principles. So when we're looking then at principle three and four, I actually just touched on the reporting angle. So reporting in, is critical for this, and it's critical uh, for the lenders to know whether or not you've indeed hit your sustainability target. It's critical for the general public or investors, if it's a public company, to know, you know whether and how you hit your sustainability target. Um, and it's also really relevant because you need to demonstrate as a borrower that again, you're tracking and measuring and that you're willing to put it out publicly to say, yeah, not only have we tracked and measured internally for years, we're publicly now reporting because we are publicly committed to trying to do our best to achieve these targets and actually putting some skin in the game in that the interest rate margin that we pay could increase if we don't actually hit these targets. Uh, there was some additional guidance that recently came out on the sustainability linked loan principles just about a month ago. Um, strongly advising uh, that the borrowers report and then the fourth category uh, have independent third party review. It's gone from just sort of recommended best practices to strongly advising that the reporting and the reviewing occurs, which makes a lot of sense. Again, we want transparency in the market. We want to avoid any allegations of greenwashing uh, or sustainability linked loan washing. Um, you obviously want to set you know, meaningful categories, but also ones that can be reviewed and reviewed not only by the lender or in the Maple Leaf case, the syndicate of lenders. So there were a number of banks involved. That was a syndicated loan deal. Um, but they need, they need the comfort of knowing that you have reported it publicly and that you are also tracking uh, and, and having that measured independently by a third party auditor or engineering consultancy or environmental consultancy type agency. And 
And this is great where a company like 360 Energy, you know, has the capabilities and has the skill set to do this, especially on the, the reporting and the review side. Um, they are great partners that we look to, you know, that to, to engage in the future with our borrowers, many of which, you know, have the best intentions, but don't necessarily know how to report or, or how to, you know, have that third party review. So uh, encourage you to, to be in touch with David and team at 360, and, and we certainly will be going forward. On slide four, uh, I've set out the common sustainability performance targets, and this is according to the sustainability linked loan principles. I've touched on a few of these, but, but, but really the reason I have the, the top two is the two biggest boxes um, is because those are the most common targets. So, you know, I mentioned that this came, you know, these, these trends, uh, trends uh, these products, pardon me, first came to market in 2017. Um, the vast majority of them are either linked to a external ESG rating or to greenhouse gas emissions or some combination of those two or greenhouse gas emissions plus, you know, some of the other categories that you'll see on this slide. Um, we're starting to see a little bit more the foray into uh, social principles as well. So everything you're seeing on this page would be considered environmental targets. Um, renewable energy, energy efficiency, biodiversity projects. But we're also, we did, we worked with WST, an engineering consultancy firm based out of Montreal in uh, February. They announced a sustainability link loan where one of their three targets was actually linked to uh, increasing the number of women in management positions. Um, recall when I was talking about the principles, point number one being that whatever the policy or whatever the target you ultimately choose is, it has to be related to you as a priority or an objective from a sustainability perspective. Increasing the number of women in management positions is a very important objective for WSD. So in that case, it made sense for one of the three KPIs that they selected and that we worked with them on. It made sense that one of the three was a social metric, the other two being environmental in that case. So the targets you're seeing on this slide four are suggestive. It's not that you'd have to necessarily choose any one of these as your KPI or as your target, um, but they are suggestive in a way to say that these would be accepted um, you know, by the market. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because these are sort of the major environmental categories. But in every case, it's, you know, what makes the most sense is, what is, is you know, what's aligned with the borrower strategy and what's most important in the industry in which they operate. Okay, the Maple Leaf transaction. So on slide five, you'll see um, just a quick overview of the Maple Leaf Foods uh, sustainability link loan in December. So we acted, as I've mentioned, as a sustainability structuring agent on this $2 billion deal. Now, what was critical for this transaction is really Maple Leaf Foods, uh, prior to us coming into the picture with this product, was really their incredible commitment to sustainability. So they had made a very public commitment to be the most sustainable protein company on earth. Uh, and then, you know, I think that was back in 2017. And then again in 2019, um, prior to us even engaging with them on this product, they had announced that they were carbon neutral and the first major meat protein company in the world to be carbon neutral, which is quite an achievement. Um, when we saw that, uh, you know, we picked up the phone and, and, and called Maple Leaf Foods and said, clearly you are a company that we already knew this, but very publicly now is very committed to sustainability. What if we, you know, tried to structure this innovative product with you that really aligns with some sustainability goals that you've set very publicly in your ESG report, but really supports you, uh, you know, in achieving those goals and, and from our perspective, Demo actually ties our cost of capital or our profitability potential to you guys achieving those goals. So where we ultimately landed with Maple Leaf Foods were sort of two categories of goals. One was for them to remain carbon neutral. And by remaining carbon neutral, that was one sort of standalone sustainability target that we'd set. That was really relevant because it took a lot of work and a lot of investment for Maple Leaf Foods to become carbon neutral, to become again, one of the first in industry and to maintain carbon neutrality, particularly in light of some of their business objectives over the next three to five years, that was going to take a significant investment, both from a capital as well as um, infrastructure perspective. And so that was a very meaningful um, a KPI for them because it was going to, it is going to be, and it's going to take a lot of work for them to remain carbon neutral. 
The second bucket of sustainability targets that we uh, we negotiated and landed on with Maple Leaf Foods were what you're seeing in the bottom right of this slide around uh, indirect energy, so electricity usage, uh, water usage, and waste diversion from landfill. So in all of these cases, they were looking to reduce their amount of electricity, amount of water usage, and reduce the amount of waste to landfill. Um, again, really helpful in Maple Leaf's case was Obviously, they were tracking, measuring, and reporting in their ESG report, but they'd also set uh, public goals out to 2025 as well for these categories, as well as a number of others saying, you know, by 2025, and you can see them on this page, we want to reduce our electricity usage by 50%, similarly water, similarly solid waste. So, so when, when you have a company or a borrower that has set very public goals, it makes it easier from a structuring agent's perspective because then you can look at that goal and sort of work backwards and figure out a way to, again, either incentivize them to achieve that goal earlier or incentivize them to push a little bit further than maybe they had planned to initially. So we really worked backwards for these three categories on the goals that they had set and were able to structure very meaningful, very purposeful, but also very ambitious goals uh, after a lot of discussion with their treasurer and with their sustainability group. So. All in all, it was a, a great transaction. Um, I have a page here from the Globe and Mail. It did get a fair amount of press and coverage uh, as being the first in Canada, which for us was just really exciting because Maple Leaf Foods has been a great client of ours for a number of years. And it was good to see that we were able to work with them to align a product with their sustainability strategy and, and really incent and encourage them to uh, you know, work hard towards that goal. You know, for BMO's perspective, um, I mentioned at the top, we, we have a $400 billion commitment to mobilize towards sustainable finance. This is an example of us getting capital to companies that are very dedicated to sustainability and, and are pursuing really meaningful outcomes for the environment. Um, so for us, it was a, a great win as well, but we were, we were happy to have structured this one. And, and to the earlier question, we are now talking to a range of borrowers uh, about different sizes of facilities and, and whether we can structure something very bespoke and unique for them. On slide six, I just have a select number of examples, and this is just to give you a sort of a sense across the spectrum from a few different continents of, of the types of uh, both credit facilities that we're seeing and size, of course, but maybe more interestingly and relevantly is some of the sustainability targets uh, that the borrowers have ultimately landed on. And so I mentioned the WSP example uh, off the top as we were a co-lead on that facility. Uh, again, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions was one of their three targets increasing the revenue derived from environmental type um, companies because they're a consulting firm. And then thirdly, increasing women in management positions. All very relevant for the industry in which they operated uh, and all their very relevant and meaningful goals were and targets were set with WSP uh, for that particular transaction. I won't go through all of them um, other than to point out BMO also uh, was joint book runner on the energy uh, facility as well you'll see in the U.S. in June of 2019. Uh, that one was, was linked to the, the two uh, environmental goals around greenhouse gas emissions and, and carbon intensity reductions as well. Uh, and lastly, you know, just touching on the rationale for an SLL. So when we're out speaking to borrowers, you know, we're talking to them from our sustainable finance team's perspective about a variety of different sustainable, sustainability strategies and products that we could help them to achieve their goals. And you know, some of the benefits that come from an SLL and, and just you know, green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds as well, just green or, or social products are really that you're demonstrating out to the world your, your sustainability strategy. So the, the first uh, row you're seeing is you know, demonstrating it to investors. Yes, no question. You're telling the world, hey, investors, look at us. We are committed to sustainability and we have a long-term strategy from an ESG perspective and that carries over uh, from, to a business model perspective as well. We're going to be here for the long term. Um, but it also signals that type of message obviously as well to the general public, to regulators, uh, which you know more and more we're hearing from, uh, just to customers as well, of course, and then internally to employees. And you'll see the last row is a valuable experience for employees. One of the really cool pieces of feedback that we received from Maple Leaf Foods was really how their employees were proud of the sustainability link loan. And when I say that, what I mean is more and more we're seeing employees, especially younger ones that want to work at companies where their personal values align with their corporate values. 
and don't get me wrong, that sustainability link loan is not going to fully get you there, but it is one further example of a company's commitment to sustainability. And many younger employees in particular are committed to sustainability and, and really care about that. So it makes them proud to work there, which has a number of positive benefits. But of course, from an engagement uh, retention perspective, you can actually potentially see some upticks with that. And again, it's one product in, in your overall sustainability story, but it's one product that does tell that, tell that story. And so I think it can be a meaningful experience for employees. And, and employees get to be involved in a way, like, again, I mentioned speaking to the treasurer of Maple Leaf Foods, maybe that wasn't something that would have crossed his desk every day. Maybe looking at a sustainability type product was maybe the first time you'd seen that or was, you know, just generally hadn't, hadn't seen those products come across. And that is something that it was a kind of a unique take on a product that we could then bring to him as a solution. Obviously, potential cost savings for the borrower. Um, you know, you may look at this as well. So because most of them are two ways, so interest rate margin increase if the borrower doesn't hit their targets, I suppose there's potential um, price advantages for the bank as well, but that's not really the way that we look at it. Um, we had, there not a lot of sustainability link loans have actually had to ratchet up. Uh, this is now globally and, you know, resulted in additional um, profitability for the lenders. That actually hasn't really happened to date. Uh, to the extent it does, you'd assess it on a case-by-case -case basis, but that's definitely not the purpose from the lender's perspective in entering into these products. Um, and so I think the key is really structuring in a way where, yes, if, you know, the company makes some significantly wrong turns and they really dramatically miss their, their targets, then sure, they end up paying additional pricing. Uh, but that is not really the, the goal of, of this particular product. Uh, and of course, the last advantage being a, a positive in, environmental impact, particularly if those targets are environmental focused. Okay. Um, John, it, I've got uh, some questions that have come up. Um, so I'll kind of go through them here. Um, what do you find uh, the biggest challenge uh, is for customers to undertake uh, the process for app applying? Yeah, that's a great question. So for sure, the, the biggest pain point or challenge is are our borrowers or our customers already tracking and reporting on what their existing sustainability performance is? That's not an easy process to undertake. Um, obviously, for greenhouse gas emissions, as an example, you need to follow the greenhouse gas protocol. You need to understand from a very, very scope one and two emissions perspective, you know, what are our company's emissions? So that's the first part. And the second part is, and where do we intend to be in five years? So let's say it's a five-year facility, and I've just been using five years because, you know, it can be any term of facility, more than two years, basically. Um, so where do we intend to get to, and what's reasonable for us given you know, the business realities of where we expect to take our business. Not a lot of businesses that we speak to intend to get smaller over the next five years. Most intend to grow. So with that comes some uncertainty around, well, what is, we, we may know what our CHP footprint is today, but what could it be in five years? And so some challenges we have is around, you know, are you have a baseline amount of whatever the environmental target you're proposing is? And then what are your goals into the future? Because if you have those two pieces, you know, BMO can step in and help structure a loan in a, in a, in a target in a meaningful way. But without that as sort of the baseline, it becomes really difficult because then it becomes an exercise of trying to sort of cobble together what the current day targets and amounts are, and that can take some time for some borrowers. Great. Um, I, there's a few more questions that have come up. I just want to see, like, do you have, are you, are you, is there more to your presentation before I go on and, and start uh, giving you more questions? Or No, I think it's perfect time for questions, and, and only because after this I have, like, a page or two of creds from BMO, and nobody wants to hear that. I think I've spoken about BMO. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, general question here. So, how many companies are you finding are, investigating this um, this type of loan on an, on an annual basis at this point? Is it like well known or are you getting a lot of applicants? Pre-COVID or post-COVID? Yeah, I mean, so, <laughs> guess what I was thinking. Um, shortly after we announced this transaction with Maple Leaf Foods in December, a lot of interest for the first three, in the first three months of 2020. Um, a lot of different companies 
uh, looking at their own existing facility and, and looking at ways to potentially align it with their sustainability goals. Um, I can't disclose the exact number uh, only for competitive reasons, but I can tell you significant. And that's a really good thing for the market. From March or so, or end of March on, it has tapered off significantly. I think, you know, a lot of our clients are looking for working path in this time. They're maybe less focused on longer term sustainability strategy, more focused on just kind of keeping the lights on and ensuring that they, you know, have enough working path to get through this difficult period for a lot of borrowers. So the conversations around SLL, there's still general interest, but I would say in terms of um, actually sitting down in the nitty gritty and structuring one, it's, it's fallen off a little bit in the existing COVID world. And a lot of that's just because pricing of loans has really fluctuated as well. Okay. Um, so given the Maple Leaf example, um, so that's a $2 billion dollar loan so it's likely to take obviously several years to pay off uh, can you describe the process that you would use to monitor verify and continue to push the envelope on goals throughout the, re the repayment period yeah so i should note this it was a revolving credit facility in uh, in maple leaf case so it wasn't a kind of day one fifty billion dollar loan it is, it is a revolver so they'll, they'll use the proceeds as necessary um, what we've committed to do, because we have annual benchmarks against the sort of the two categories of targets that I mentioned, um, we will be working closely with their uh, sustainability team at Maple Leaf, uh, particularly on an annual basis, but probably even a little more regularly to check in just to get some progress updates. You know, we tied the reporting uh, period under the, the revolving credit facility credit agreement. We tied that to their publication of their sustainability report meaning that their process internally will be very similar in terms of how they go about uh, how they go about determining their carbon neutrality and then these three targets on, on slide five. Um, that same process will hold. They, they do have auditing in place, uh, both third party and internal auditing for the targets. Um, so that's really encouraging. So, but at some point before they release that sustainability report, uh, we would be setting up calls and meetings with them to for us the sustainability structuring agent to look over their results that have been audited and then to uh, to discuss them and socialize them with the syndicate of lenders as well. That, that'll happen on a single basis. Okay. Um, have you seen that? Well, and you might have already kind of answered this in, a, in, a, in part. Um, have you seen products like this push borrowers to consider sustainability who would not have previously done so? Yeah, and I'll even take it a step further. Um, we, we have seen that. We've also seen uh, companies and sectors that are traditionally not considered good ESG sectors necessarily, that maybe didn't even think they had a sustainability strategy. And yet, you know, once you start unpacking some of their operations, even though they may not have been publicly reported, but in many cases, you know, they're tracking and measuring some of their env environmental externalities and inputs you don't have to be a green borrower in the case of an SLL. It's, it's almost like a transition facility, right? You're wherever you are today is your baseline. You're then pushing to improve from that particular baseline. So what we have seen is like, you know, uncovering different, you know, um, environmental improvement strategies that companies have. And, and by the way, they're, they're not looking at it that way. And that's why I mentioned off the top, they may not even know that they're necessarily committed to ESG. They're looking at it from a dollars and cents perspective. They're looking at it from P&L to say, all right, if we can have less oil spills, if we're a, a barge company or a marine transportation company, that will inc that'll improve our bottom line. When I look at that from the sustainability link loan perspective, I say, if you can have less oil spills, that could be a relevant KPI for a sustainability link loan. And by the way, it'll save you additional money in paying environmental fines and things. So win-win. Um, so yeah, a lot of really good conversations clients that you may not have otherwise expected to either have been committed or maybe hadn't been committed publicly, but are, are you know, making efforts to improve. Okay, thanks for that. Um, how is, here's my, this might be a bit of a tricky one. How is government funding for specific projects viewed and treated in the assessment process? Um, oh, interesting question. So, would it be put another way, if, if 
a borrower receives government funding and is just going to use that funding to make the improvement from a ESG perspective? Should that, like, is that a fair target? Is that kind of what the question is? I, I, I think so. I'll, I'll wait for the, the original asker um, to kind of clarify maybe if, if that's, that is the question, but let's, let's start there. <laughs> okay, it's a good question. Listen, like, I think the flexibility of this product you know, and, and I mentioned like it doesn't, you don't have to use the proceeds from sustainability link loan to solve for whatever that, you know, environmental or social issue you're trying to solve for is. But I guess the way that I would look at it as a structuring agent is we are furthering the good, we are improving the company's ESG performance um, by, by, by creating this product. But if they're using other proceeds or other revenue to attain those sustainability goals, then that's great. At the end of the day, what we're looking for is ESG or environmental or social improvement from the borrower. Um, we are less fussed about whether it's kind of dollar for dollar from this loan that they're using or whether they're getting it from something like a government fund or a third party in some, in some capacity. I think, that's, I think that's okay. You know, you wouldn't want to create a program where, you know, a company or a borrower is receiving all of their uh, sort of CapEx from government because then what, maybe what's the point of the SLL if they're going to, going to be using those proceeds anyway towards those targets. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to put any limitations and the market has to put limitations on how the proceeds are used from the loan. So I personally wouldn't have issues uh, with the government funds being used to achieve the very targets and we sat down and negotiated with the borrower. Okay, thank you for that. Um... So here's kind of a good, uh, another good question. So what uh, role do you think sustainability should hold in economic recovery post COVID and how can BMO play a role to promote this? Yeah, great question. Um, what we're seeing with COVID is, you know, one of the greatest social risks that the economy has faced in the, in the perspective of a few things. So a global pandemic has caused significant Supply chain disruption. It has, you know, caused disruptions in food security. We've seen health and safety of employees and customers all come to the forefront. We've seen good performers in, from a social risk perspective, those that are female employees as well, for instance. Um, we've seen bad performers as well. And what I expect is once COVID lifts, and I'm saying once with it, it will, um, I think customers and the general public are going to remember those good performers and bad performers. And again, this is from a social perspective. So that will play into consumer decisions and whatnot going forward. From an environmental perspective, I mean, everyone's seeing the videos of the Himalayas and, you know, and then we've seen for the first time and the clear water from Venice. And, and it's true. Greenhouse gas emissions are down significantly over the past few months, usually a year ago. What I hope really hopeful for and certainly the Canadian government has made this a priority is you know we almost have a blank canvas now to say okay how do we set ourselves up from an environmental perspective to ensure that we as an economy are best positioned to transition into a green future and let's be clear we need a green future the commitment for you know science scientific um, targets as well as with the Paris climate agreement and a one and a half two scenario it requires significant investment transition in a number of different sectors. I think companies like Demo and other lenders are going to have to be at the forefront of making sure we're getting capital to companies that are committed to the future, which means being committed to environmental solutions and being better environmental stewards. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as much as I see this big focus on social right now through COVID, and that makes a lot of sense, I think that will have implications uh, in the short and medium term. The focus on environment is really interesting to me because we have such an opportunity now in the marketplace to really make a difference, and we have this blank canvas to say, let's make sure we're financing the companies in the right way. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. All right, so we've got another question here. Um, should a public entity with an already very favorable borrowing rate um, expect less or zero interest rate benefit from an SLL versus a standard loan compared to what a commercial entity might expect? Um, yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some magic in the interest rate reduction potential. And I should have mentioned, 
what we're seeing in North America is anywhere between three to 10 basis points reduction, uh, reduction potential or increased potential on an, on an SLL. So a company that's already receiving a very favorable rate, I mean, I would say in every case, it has to be bespoke to the particular borrower. Um, if it's so tight that a, you know, a, a five or 7% basis point reduction would bring it very close to zero, then that's sort of on the lender to say, is this a, is this a discount we're willing to give to this particular borrower? For sure, when it's a, call it a higher risk or non-investment grade type borrower, um, there's more room to maneuver. Um, and I would say, wherever you ultimately land on what the correct basis point change should be, um, th there's ways you can get creative with it, right? So you could even do a layered approach where it's three basis points if you just improve a little bit, again, above business as usual, but like you're kind of your, your lowest rung in terms of improvement, 3% basis points, 5% if you go a step further, all the way, or sorry, 5%, five basis points, all the way up to say 10 basis points, if you knock it out of the park and you overachieve on the goals that you told us when we sat down were unattainable for you. So you can almost use a layered or tiered approach as well. Um, but to answer the question directly, it really depends on the borrower. And that was the question itself. I think it, you know, you want to, you want to create a product that makes sense for the borrower and from the lender's perspective, that makes sense for you as well, of course. So you need to at the very least be covering your costs with a particular facility and, and uh, look at the long-term relationship with the particular borrower. Hi. You still there, Julie? Yep, sorry about that. I just realized I was speaking with myself on mute there. Um, so that is actually uh, all the questions that we've got uh, right at the moment, unless uh, any others pop up um, in the next uh, few seconds. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank you very much. I think um, you know you, you had some great information uh, that you've presented today. Um, we had a lot of good questions. And of course, I did just uh, get another question in, if you're cool with that. Um, That's fair. That I'll ask in a second here. Uh, so um, this is a comment from the person that asked the government uh, question. So normally, government funding makes up a certain percentage of the project funding. Uh, often, ap applicants will use confirmed government funding to access private sector funding for a project. So just wondering if SLLs recognize government funding as an additional security for a project. All right, okay. interesting. Um, that makes sense. So I guess the point is, yes, um, we are, and by the way, the, the, the Maple Leaf loan was an unsecured loan. Uh, it was a revolving credit facility, so it's nearly unsecured. But um, we, we haven't looked at a secured one yet in terms of like using the government funding specifically as security. Um, you know, you could, but at the same time, I think what we're looking to and through is really the credit worthiness of the borrower. And, and let's put it this way, we wouldn't enter into an SLL with a borrower if, you know, we thought, if we thought that they were going to, you know, be at credit default risk. And in saying that, what I mean is um, we would do a, a credit worthiness assessment independent of the SLL. We would look at the SLL and we would say, okay, independently, you know, this client is X from a credit worthiness perspective. You know, our long-term play and our thesis at BMO and this is supported, you know, in the market is those companies that are committed to sustainability and ESG over the long term will be more profitable and it shows a long-term view and commitment to really meaningful material risk. And so I, I would say it would be nothing but improve their credit credit worthiness from a borrower perspective. So so the answer to the question is simply we haven't actually done a secured facility, but I, you know, we'd be open to doing so, and I don't think if it were government funds that were pledged to security, I don't think that would change the SLL, certainly not the pricing or anything around it or, or the setting of the targets. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, and just, to, so, you know, in general, thank you very much again for a great presentation today. Um, just to kind of uh, echo what uh, John kindly said, please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, we can definitely, if you have any more questions, if you want to look further into or investigate further into a sustainability um, loan, please again, do feel free to reach out to us. We can ask uh, questions. We can definitely put you in touch with John if you don't uh, want to get in touch with him uh, directly or if you can't get him in, in touch with him directly, we can definitely um, organize that. 
Um, so again, John, thanks very much again for your time today. Um, I don't know if you had any more that you wanted to kind of add in uh, before we're before we're done. I don't want to step on your toes at all. Um, but uh, all. Yeah, yeah. Was I just wanted to thank you uh, and the 360 team for having me on today. And thanks for everyone for showing up and listening. And I hope to see more of this product in the market. Excellent. So thanks again, everyone. And again, feel free to reach out to us if you have any more questions that come up. And uh, thanks again, John. And uh, hope everybody here has a great day. Thank you.